this is the big one. Richard here, and welcome to this edition of Hyclopedia. With the Mount Everest season fast approaching, I decided to put together a video of my 2018 trip to Nepal, when Hugo and I got to tick off that particular bucket list event. Now, I never really intended to make a YouTube video of my trip, but after looking at the footage, I decided it might be a good idea to put together a short film as a guide for anybody who's interested in doing the same. Uh, I booked the trip through one of the many thousands of trekking companies there in Nepal. Himalayan Guide Nepal, run by a really nice fella called Chandra. It wasn't recommended to me by anybody in particular, but I just did a lot of online research, looking at review sites, and um, this company had a lot of positive reviews. And upon reflection, I think I chose pretty well because the trip was well organized and everything went smoothly, and Chandra was really easy to deal with. Living in Singapore, it was a relatively trouble-free trip by a Kuala Lumpur from me, while Hugo flew in from Taiwan. After getting our visas on arrival, we were picked up at the airport by our guide and then taken to our hotel, where we received a friendly Nepali welcome before heading to our room for a good night's sleep ahead of our mammoth day tour of Kathmandu. On the street, in Patan. With your best, best trekking buddy. Oh, come on. Who's that? Come on. Show, <laughs> show the people. Yeah. I'd been to Nepal 20 years earlier and honestly not much had changed bar some earthquake damage. The city is a bit like something from an Indiana Jones movie. It's a charming yet chaotic place with lots of crazy things going on, but it can be a bit of a culture shock if it's your first visit to Asia. It's also a great place to make new friends, although this can prove a little tiring. Our guide, who was included in the trip cost, took us to all the main tourist spots in Kathmandu before delivering us back to the hotel for a well-deserved beer. Everest, of course and a final night in civilization before day one of our Himalayan odyssey. We're on our way to the airport, say good morning. Good morning. And it's pretty cool. And let's 14. have a look what's going on on the other side. Hi. <laughs> Don't get run over. <laughs> After getting to the airport early the next morning, we ended up waiting around for several hours as the airport at our destination, Lukla, was enshrouded in cloud. As I was on a pretty tight schedule due to work, we eventually decided we could wait no longer and took a helicopter instead. We are helicopter bound. What do you think? Uh, a bit scared. <laughs> We're going on a helicopter. Oh my god. This is experience for oh. uh, a new whole new experience which I'm actually not looking forward to to be honest but hey we'll see what happens we're just trying to get the bags in the helicopter right now
after a stressful few hours and a nerve-wracking first ever helicopter flight, we took lunch in Lukla before setting off on the first leg of our journey, the eight kilometer stretch to Fakding, along with our porter Lakpa, who we had picked up in town. On the trail, day one, Lukla to Fakding. It's an easy day today, about 10 kilometers. And we're almost there, maybe one or two more left to go. The hike up to Fat Ding was relatively stress-free. You wind your way through a fertile valley, passing a plethora of carved prayer stones, cute kids, and crossing several rickety suspension bridges. After a couple of hours, we arrived at our lodge and settled down for the night, enjoying dinner with several other groups, including a large party of Iranians who were off to scale the nearby island peak. Day two saw a gain of almost 800 meters as we headed to Namcha Bazaar. And although the distance was only seven to eight kilometers, it still took around four to five hours. The terrain was similar to day one, following the river and crossing several more suspension bridges. There was some beautiful scenery along the way, and we also met lots of interesting characters. Before we found ourselves at the end of the valley, facing the daunting Namcha footbridge. This is the big one, the biggest, tallest bridge on the way to Namcha Bazaar. I'm gonna look down in a minute. Oh my God, check that shit out. It's quite high and it's quite scary. <laughs> Just try not to drop my phone. Okay. I want to actually get off this bridge as quickly as possible. Oh, stop! <laughs> oh, people are people have stopped it in front. I just want to get off. <laughs> Once safely across, it was a steady ascent of around 600 meters into Namcha Bazaar, the last major town en route to base camp and the trading hub of the Kombu region. So we settled down to a hearty meal, unknowingly imitating a couple of other dudes who had been here a few years before us. Day three on most EBC itineraries involves spending a day at Namcha to get your body used to the ever thinning air. It's also a great place to do some last minute shopping and grab a pint if you fancy, although that's probably best left to the return leg. The morning's acclimatization hike was a leisurely walk above the town to the nearby Sherpa Culture Museum for a few photos and then a cup of tea at the Everest View Hotel. A slow descent and a day spent relaxing in Namcha helps to raise the number of red blood cells. We've just been up about 400 meters to acclimatize for tomorrow. Well, we'll be climbing another, maybe ascending another 600 meters or so. Day four was a roughly 12 kilometer hike along high mountain paths to the small village of Debouche. It also afforded us our first really good views of Everest from the trail. And it is here that you really start to feel like you're in high mountain country as horses and mules give way to yacht trains. First yaks of the trip. The route then took us past the large Buddhist monastery at Dengboshe, where expeditions planning to summit Everests usually get a blessing from the resident monks. It's a really good place to take a break and explore, especially if you've never seen a Tibetan-style monastery before. After Dengboshe, the undulating trail takes you past the stall of Pasang Lama Sherpa, a local celebrity who collects donations and uses the money to maintain the Everest Base Camp Trail. After five to six hours on the road, we eventually reached the small town of Debuche, where it was time for yet another cup of tea, another bowl of dal bart, and a chance to practice my rusty Mandarin with a group of Chinese trekkers. Day five, it's about 
So we're gonna have breakfast in an hour and then we're gonna be off for the day. The cold weather and a light covering of snow made for perfect weather on day five and the 10 kilometer trek to Dingboche. Uh, we just left the bouche and we're walking towards Dingboche. And as you can see, we had snow overnight and you can see Mount Everest in the background with all the snow kicking off the summit. And there's another famous mountain called Amadabra. It's kind of like being in a winter wonderland. The drop in temperature made things really comfortable while the snow transformed the surrounding landscape. Walking over a pretty high suspension bridge and this Hugo in the background and it's bouncing around all over the place and I'm pooping myself but almost at the end there's a bit of scenery over there. What do you think about that? After a short drink stop and a late lunch, enjoyed with some friendly locals, we made our way into Dingboche, just as the weather began to take a turn for the worse. Here we are in the lovely Dingboche, altitude 4,410 meters. It's bloody cold and as you can see it's snowing too. And the weather's gone a bit shitty this afternoon. But we made it safe and sound. And tomorrow we've got an acclimatization day, yay! So we haven't got to go anywhere, apart from maybe up another couple of hundred meters. Hopefully the weather will be a bit better. It was here that I really began to appreciate the power of yak poop, as temperatures drop well below zero once the sun disappears behind the mountains. And poop provides the only source of fuel for the whole lodge. Something you begin to appreciate when you return to your freezing cold room. The next morning brought clear skies and crisp cold air until the sun rose above the nearby peaks and quickly brought an end to our sub-zero suffering. Morning on day six and as you can see it's pretty damn cold. It snowed last night and just got up six o'clock in the morning. The sun came out and hopefully once that hits things will warm up a bit. Whoa. The altitude is beginning to uh, take effect now. Got a bit of a headache, but it's nothing to worry about. Anyway, I'm too cold now, I'm going back inside. Day six is a climatization hike involved a quick trek up the south side of Nang Ka Shang, the peak that looms directly above the village of Dingboche. Enthusiastic hikers can go up to a minor peak at around 5,100 meters, although we didn't get that high and called it a day at around 4,800 meters where just north of Agompa is a beautiful spot to stop, relax, take in the scenery, get used to the ever thinning air and photobomb your newfound Thai friends. It's finished our acclimatization trek for today. I think we came about 300 meters up and now we are here. As you can see, lots of lovely mountains in the background. And uh, we're going to spend about an hour here before we go back down and uh, relax before the bad weather comes in. I think you can see in the background there's a lot of cloud coming in. So we might have some more snow. So we're going to spend the afternoon in a bakery watching a movie and trying to get used to this thin air. Okay, here we go. We're on our way to the movie house. Try to avoid on the way these gigantic piles of horse food. After arriving at the cafe, we enjoyed a piece of cake, a latte, and the last semblance of civilization before base camp. As we took in a great movie that really opened our eyes to the plight of Nepal's hardworking Sherpas, as well as shedding some light on the circus that scaling the world's highest peak has become in recent years. Afterwards, we returned to the lodge for dinner, where we met an amazing Japanese retiree whose athleticism and ambition put us both to shame. Day 7 takes you from Dingboche to Lobuche, ascending to just under 5,000 meters while covering a distance of around 10 kilometers. 
The first part of the trek takes you along a plateau above the town of Ferrishe. It's a stunning setting, although my enjoyment of it was cut short by an emergency toilet stop behind a stone wall that I can only put down to the previous evening's meal. Seven. We're getting closer and closer to Vista. And now uh, yeah, the terrain's changed. And we've got glaciers, glacier beds, big mountains of course. And then uh, we've got to cross this glacier bed in a minute. And then have lunch at that place over there. A lunch stop at Thukla, situated at the terminus of the Kombu Glacier, then steals you for the exhausting long haul up the next slope, to Evernew Heights and Everest's very own Memorial Park. And we're on the way to Debuche, which is the last but one stop before we reach base camp. It's pretty high now, we're about 5,000 meters, and we've just finished a big climb, and we're at the memorial to all the climbers that have died on Everest over the years. And if you pan around, see there's a lot more it's a big crowd of people there and you can see various memorial stupas or what I'm not sure what they're called exactly um, to all the climbers who died including some of the more famous ones like from the movie Everest there's uh, the grave of well the memorial of Scott Fisher I guess it's probably still up there More interesting characters and another couple of hours later we arrive at the frontier town of Lobuche. And here we are at Lobuche village. As you can see, it's a bit, how can you say, basic, but you know, after walking as far as we have done today, it doesn't really matter. I'm just glad to be here. After the relative comforts of Dingbushe, Lobuche presents new challenges as the guest houses and their facilities become more and more rudimentary. While the altitude really begins to take its toll, although we both manage to put on a brave face. Okay, I'm here on the side of uh, the side wall of the glacier. I know there's a proper term for it, but I'm not sure what it is. Um, looking at uh, base camp off in the distance. Yeah, tomorrow hopefully. And, uh, Alongside this glass here, it's pretty amazing. You can actually hear it moving. The cracks and sounds as the ice slowly moves down the path. Um, we're going to actually be on that tomorrow sometime and heading up in that direction. I'm not exactly sure where, but anyway, it's absolutely beautiful up here, although it's a little bit cold. We need to get back to the lodge before the sun goes down in about an hour. At altitude 5,000 meters, it's hard to breathe. The amazing scenery doesn't help you sleep though, and after a tough, headache-filled night, we were finally off on the final leg of our expedition. Okay, we're on the way to base camp, and it's pretty cold. Hugo is walking in front, and um, it's a bit like being on the moon, but um, it's beautiful. leg. We're, base camp is in sight but it's in the opposite direction. He's, uh, he's doing a great job even though he's a pessimist. I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist. 
Anyway, we're gonna be there. We're gonna be there in about an hour. So chin up and let's get on with it. The walk to base camp from Lobache via Gorak Shep isn't tough at all, but the altitude means that you will still feel it even if you are reasonably fit. Still, it's worth all the effort when you finally reach what is the world's highest tented city. He said that he couldn't make it. He doubted himself every step of the way. But guess what? Mr. Hugo Bandy has made it to Everest Base Camp and he's still alive. Oh. Hey! How does it feel? How does it feel? Thank you, thank you. Are you going to answer my question? <laughs> How does it feel? Fantastic, really exhausting. And here we are, Everest Base Camp. There's our man, Porter. Lapka. Oh my god. He's been here about 7,000. No boo. 7,000. And there's the big beast itself in the background, although you can't see the summit. And there's some prayer flags. Video, yeah? Go. It's a real shame that you only get to spend an hour or so at base camp, but schedules are tight on most organized treks, which means there is only a short time to take in the scale of your achievement and the sheer magnitude of your surroundings. After an uncomfortable night at Gorak Shep, an early morning climb of Kalapatar is on most itineraries. This 400 meter climb offers a better, more spectacular view of base camp and Mount Everest. But with Hugo really suffering, I didn't fancy getting up at 4 a.m. for a freezing cold solo hike. I kind of regret not making the effort now, but at the time it seemed like the right decision. As day nine consisted of a huge slog all the way back down the valley to the village of Pangboshe a total of around 18 kilometers. And although it was mainly downhill, it was still totally exhausting. Our exhaustion that night was tempered somewhat by the company, as by some stroke of good fortune, we ended up staying at the same tea house as the British Everest expedition, which consisted of TV host Ben Fogel, Olympic gold medalist Victoria Pendleton, and mountaineer Kenton Cool. Talking to Cool was particularly interesting as he had already summited 12 times and went on to complete number 13 just a few weeks later. The rest of the return journey was just a case of retracing our steps as we spent the following night back in Namcha and then the final day crawling back into Lukla. And it's been an eventful morning after a couple of accidents. We're still going. We're still going. We've lost a soul. We've lost more and That's other it. things have happened and so three to three and a half hours slowly to look like means I will be there in six hours <laughs> and I'll be there in two <laughs> you'll be there in two I'll be there in six all in all I felt fine although completely exhausted while Hugo was suffering greatly still after 11 days and 124 kilometers I was extremely happy to be back in Lukla Welcome to Lukla. <laughs> Give us a cheer. A cheer, you can. <laughs> The exhaustion, however, didn't prevent us from having a mini celebration before we once again put ourselves at the mercy of the weather gods and attempted to catch a flight back to Kathmandu. And once again, we failed to experience Tenzing Hillary Airport in its full glory, as for a second time, we were forced to take a chopper following a frustrating wait. After 12 days in the mountains, Kathmandu, for all its faults, 
felt like paradise, and we spent our final day gorging on rich food and exploring this crazy city's ramshackle streets. We then met up with Chandra at his office for our plane ticket refund before going for our second celebration meal. This took place at a kind of communal dining hall for checking groups that served up a traditional meal of dal bart and side dishes before laying on some traditional Nepalese singing and dancing. It was a bit cheesy, truth be told, but we didn't really care as we sipped beer and enjoyed the evening chatting with Chandra, who then surprised us with a lovely commemorative plaque to mark our achievement. An unexpected yet heartwarming gesture and the perfect end to our 12-day Himalayan adventure. So that was the tale of my 12-day trip to base camp. If you have any questions about um, logistics or conditions or altitude sickness or anything like that, just please leave them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. And if you really liked it, you can always click notifications, get the yak bell on. And um, that's it for today. Over and out until next Monday.